Hello everyone. A huge thank you to the ISME Forum on Instrumental and Vocal Teaching for hosting us in this online seminar. I'm Bridget Rennie Salonen, a professional musician in education and performance, and also a somatic educator. Together with my colleague Bronwyn Ackerman, a specialist musician, physiotherapist, and anatomist, We'll present a case study on a multidisciplinary team approach for the effective rehabilitation of a musician with dystonia. Our aim is to illustrate to you the benefits of the collaborative roles and an integrated teamwork approach, which we implemented in an embouchure dystonia rehabilitation protocol. Firstly, just discussing musicians' performance-related health problems, Many of the reports of these are principally around the musculoskeletal system, often relating to injuries related to long hours of playing that occurs in the muscular system. However, there are many performance related health problems in other systems, such as vocal, psychological, auditory uh, issues, such as noise uh, induced hearing loss, and so on. The other group that are very common are neurological issues. There are a range of these, some are uh, related to uh, perhaps pressure or stretching of nerves in the, in the arms, for example, from a lot of muscle use. Uh, but there's a large percentage of these that relate to motor control disorders. The prevalence of these is unclear because they overlap quite commonly with other issues. So for example, uh, Professor Eckhart Altenmuller, an esteemed neurologist in this area, defines a loss of motor control in musicians as coming under five principal categories. One is motor fatigue. So what this means is when muscles get tired, the body will choose alternate muscles to perform a particular task uh, due to those, uh, the muscles you've been overusing, running out of fuel, so to speak. So being unable to complete the task anymore because they're too tired. Overuse injuries, what happens when you chronically overuse muscles is that the brain gets confused about uh, representation of body parts. So um, fingers, instead of knowing where each finger is individually, uh, the fingers will appear as a clump in the brain. It makes the brain a bit fuzzy if you keep overusing it. Choking under pressure, so this is the psychological effect on uh, motor control or on how you move. So uh, you suddenly can't move, you suddenly can't play, the notes aren't coming out because you're under a lot of stress. Dynamic stereotype in musicians is a term we phrase when movements aren't moving as you would ideally like to within your technique, but the way these patterns happen is fairly typical for different instrumentalists. So you might see a bow arm, that he is not moving in the right way, uh, taking a certain pattern that's fairly typical, dysfunctional kind of pattern. So these are these dynamic stereotypes that we often work with if we're trying to improve the, if you like, the way you move when you play your instrument. We, we call this biomechanics, so uh, body, body mechanics when you're playing your instrument. If these movements become uh, hard for the musician to control if they've actually lost the ability to uh, feel these movements and correct these movements themselves. This is when we have this condition focal dystonia. So this is considered to be when you lose that ability to uh, control movements in the normal way you would. A little bit now on focal dystonia. It is severely debilitating and in many cases a career ending disorder. Research shows us that approximately 1 to 2 percent of professional musicians are affected, often very highly skilled musicians, but the exact prevalence is likely to be greater due to the difficulties with diagnosis and also musicians simply stopping when they experience the symptoms. It presents as a loss of fine motor control of a particular body region which carries out complex and highly trained movements such as the hand, fingers, lips, tongue, jaw or embouchure. The symptoms are painless and include involuntary muscle spasms, tremors and flexion or extension. For example, a finger may curl or straighten in an uncontrolled way. In professional wind players, embouchure dystonia causes task-specific involuntary movements in the orofacial muscles when they play. For example, the jaw may shake or the lip may pull sideways. Some of the characteristics of focal dystonia. 
The nature of the symptoms is task specific, as I mentioned, as they are linked with specific highly trained movements in a particular activity. The etiology is complex with a number of interactive variables. There's always repetition and overuse together with movement related variables like the amount of muscle tension, efficiency and coordination. Genetic factors are involved also. Neurologically, there are changes in the brain. For example, particular areas of the brain responsible for directing a specific movement of a part of the body blur or fuse with adjacent areas. Bronwyn discussed that briefly earlier too. And dysfunction movement patterns become learnt and ingrained, something which is called maladaptive brain plasticity. There's disturbed sensory motor integration, Normally, nerve messages would be transmitted to particular parts of the brain that recognize which body part is responding. The brain then makes the appropriate movement responses. But with focal dystonia, these sensory motor processes don't function properly. We also see reduced tactile and proprioceptive ability in that the sense of touch and feel and the sense of movement and position are all diminished. Importantly, there are also always psychological interactions and behavioral attributes that are associated, such as perfectionism, anxiety, and stress. One important thing to consider when we look at focal dystonia and the causality, and you can see here, this is uh, at the worst side, on the right-hand side of the arrow here, you can see this called dystonic cramp, which is a, an old-fashioned term really to describe uh, musicians' focal dystonia. The main point of this slide is to say many things may influence it uh, if these are not addressed uh, along the way. So for example, if you have a high workload, you have a lot of uh, stress, um, whether it's at work or in your home life, uh, perhaps you just try and play more rather than trying to see what things might actually be, be going wrong in your technique. This can all build to um, uh, movement problems occurring, perhaps from fatigue and overuse originally, um, that then start to become outside of your control and uh, ultimately could result in musicians' dystonia or dystonic cramp. Ideally, in these earlier stages, in the dot part of the arrow, um, these are easy to resolve conditions, much more quickly reversible. Once we get down to the dystonic cramp end, it becomes very hard because we have to address all these factors that have led into it to help the person uh, recover from the dystonia. So um, th this continuum is certainly reversible, but much more difficult once you get to the far right. Uh, the kind of rehabilitation approaches that are typical to use with dystonia include uh, the following kind of categories. So uh, practicing particular movements, so you're trying to teach the body to move in the right way again. Uh, training with constraint where in this case we remove the movements that are not desirable. So for example, the wrist might be bending, we put a wrist splint on so that you can concentrate on retraining finger movement. So it's trying to take uh, some of the compensatory movements out of the picture so that you can focus on the particular movement you wish to fix. Uh, with these problems, uh, the sensory inputs affected, so you can't feel what the body part is doing very well. And even the tactile and proprioceptive components, as Bridget mentioned before, become affected. So we do sensory retraining. So try and get that, that sense of feel to that individual body part uh, back and normalized. We can use external techniques to help muscle activity, such as uh, measuring muscle uh, activation levels. So things like using electromyography biography, we can show the person how much their muscles are working and try and get them to consciously reduce tone. And this is called biofeedback. Neuromodulation with training. So neuromodulation may include things such as taking medications that reduce the, the, the cramping potential of your nerve system. And this is often things like antidepressants or anti-epileptic medication that, that reduce nerve uh, activation. Of course, there can be a side effect you feel generally dull, which a lot of musicians don't like. Or you could use something like Botox, which you'll see later. Botox is a, a paralysis agent. So you, you inject the muscle with something that causes the muscle to become effectively paralyzed. And this is done very carefully, done in small doses to very specific muscles to try and reduce excessive activation. This is not a curative approach. However, it's considered potentially if you use Botox and work on other elements of movements, 
perhaps you can retrain the muscles that are being um, overridden by these overactive muscles normally. And compensatory strategies can in some cases be a useful thing to develop. So we can develop new ways of moving that's not harmful for technique, that's actually a, a good thing for technique to try and reduce the impact of dystonia and move forward into, if you like, a new way to play that doesn't trigger these dystonic cramps. Now, the consideration of psychological needs is essential for the successful management and treatment of musicians' performance-related health issues, particularly something as traumatic as focal dystonia. An integrated biopsychosocial approach is widely recommended due to the interactive nature of the physiological and psychological factors. For example, in this case, a past history of multiple psychosocial and workplace stresses in the orchestra led to fear of reporting issues early on, diminished self-confidence and increased performance anxiety. Therefore, essential components of practitioners' holistic re therapeutic relationship with musicians includes validation, safety, listening, taking the necessary time, understanding the problem, appropriate referral, and collaboration between health and music professionals. So why are we reporting on this case study? Embouchure dystonia is particularly difficult to rehabilitate with multiple dysfunctions in specific musical tasks occurring at a level too deep within the oropharyngeal system to effectively observe and diagnose. While technological advancements such as high-speed MRI imaging may provide improved means for determining dysfunction, there is still a lack of knowledge of effective rehabilitation methods and standardized diagnostic evaluation and rehabilitation tools are not yet available. In fact, most health professionals do not study all the elements of the embouchure and respiratory system as it operates to produce sound in wind musicians, causing confusing advice whereby players may be encouraged to just focus on specific elements and ignore others. This has led to recent calls for teams of practitioners with expertise in all the various components to work together to ensure all elements are optimally managed and reintegrated into the desired performance outcome. This involves multiple input, ideally with integrated expertise from both music and health professionals. So in this particular study, a French horn player contacted Bridget uh, talking about problems that they had experienced in their playing, gradually increasing over two years. In the initial state where symptoms were observed, the player very correctly was referred to a neurologist to get a correct diagnosis. As Bridget has mentioned, embouchure dystonia is very difficult to treat and at times neurologists will try this paralysis agent, Botox, uh, to try and reduce excessive tone. So in this particular case, there was a high tremor in the jaw muscle, so the neurologist attempted to reduce excessive activity. Unfortunately, in general, with embouchure dystonia, Botox is not uh, successful as a whole uh, and unfortunately this was the case in this player who then was unable to play at all for six months so you can imagine the, the generalized deconditioning happening through the muscular system on top of having a neurological uh, disorder so in this uh, occasion I happened to be in South Africa and could meet with Bridget and this player to assess the embouchure problem that she was having and be able to try and guide some forward planning with Bridget as the main managing um, uh, rehabilitation provider. For this, I needed to systematically assess the posture, breathing mechanics, the function of the jaw, the pharynx or throat, the tongue and the facial muscles because from my experience and I've worked with embouchure dystonia a lot, all these muscles uh, will become affected because things will compensate around each other. So when we play an instrument, these muscles have to independently activate, like they have to be able to uh, refine certain elements of your playing on their own, but they always are connected to the other system. So it's a very complex integrated system where there's sort of this independence and dependence on each other that has to be worked on. 
So in this particular case, we wanted to set up a rehab program that's working together with Bridget, with other health professionals as needed, and to try and set up a scheme of a graded approach with a very comprehensive base of covering all the systems. When we assessed her, there are these embouchure dystonia assessment scales that are in common use. You can see on the one on the left, it goes from this stage zero of being unable to play down to stage five, where you're returning to comp concert performances without compensations. So in this case, the player started at stage zero and you'll see at the end, she gets to stage four. In the dystonia score here, the patient started with definite severe degree of dystonia. And uh, this one's more of a diagnostic category, so uh, it doesn't exactly go backwards because once you have been diagnosed with dystonia, even though you can uh, recover with prolonged effort and time, it's certainly something that you've had. You don't uh, have a past history of never having had it. And when we look at uh, free buzzing, we also saw that she had no sound production possible in the initial case. So when we looked at this particular patient in terms of her uh, effects of the embouchure dystonia, the respiratory system had been severely affected, uh, partly perhaps from the six months of not being able to play, but there was very poor air support for the expired air. So of course, when you're not providing air into the instrument with the correct support mechanisms from the lower respiratory system, so from all the muscles um, actually controlling the lungs, you end up with a lot of squeezing in the upper respiratory system, the jaw, the mouth, the tongue start to behave abnormally to try and compensate for this. Uh, this will tend to lead to forward head and neck posture. So you'll try and uh, use neck muscles to help you play, uh, which tends to put you into this position, as well as general sort of insecurity with the horn. You're trying to push your mouth onto the mouthpiece a little bit more. This also can lead to this forward head and neck posture. You end up with an unstable uh, throat position. So hyoid is the bone that sits above your glottis and it controls the length of the throat. Uh, it's also the root of the tongue. So if your um, throat length is not managed well because you're not getting this kind of constant stream of good air pressure from your lower respiratory system, your hyoid will, or this uh, glottal system will keep jumping up to try and put more pressure into your mouth to help uh, meet the resistance of the French horn. This moving around of the root of the tongue means the tongue gets completely disoriented or, or unable to function normally. And obviously this leads to very big articulatory problems. There was a lot of jaw tension in this case. The jaw was trying to compensate for everything and really the jaw in uh, wind playing or in brass playing in this case uh, is there as a scaffolding we have to have a, a nice shaping and position of the jaw, but it shouldn't be trying to play the instrument. The jaw muscles are not muscles that can affect airflow and lip aperture. She was very weak in her inner cheeks. These muscles are very important. They stabilize the corners of the mouth. Uh, buccinator means bugler's muscle in, in Latin. So it's often called the bugler's muscle. So very uh, important muscle in narrowing the oral cavity from the sides. So it's like the cheek muscle you can chew between your molars if you accidentally bite your inner cheek. Very important to realize that this actual corner support is inside your mouth, not outside your mouth. Um, and the facial muscles were all uh, fairly weak and, and not good sort of independent control of movements and also not able to control them together. So for example, for a brass player, we want to be able to stabilize the upper lip and have a bit more dynamic control of the lower lip. And she couldn't do this in this case. Just as a brief overview, uh, I'm not going to go through these muscles in detail, but just to say we have a lot of muscles that control the way we breathe and the way we shape an embouchure. <clears throat> Sometimes it's viewed a bit simplistically as breathing is just about the diaphragm. That, that, that's not in fact the case. The diaphragm is our principal breathing muscle. Uh, on the in-breath is when it activates as it descends into the abdominal cavity. On the out-breath it's completely relaxed. We rely on abdominal muscles and rib cage muscles to support the air. Uh, we do need to breathe down into these lower ribs and abdominal cavity. If we're breathing up 
into the neck to try and bring more air into our lungs, we can't really support the outbreath. There's no way to support the outbreath other than uh, tension in the glottis. On the right hand side here, when we look at these uh, structures, the, the structure you see in the middle of the picture here, um, this is where your glottis lives in your um, Adam's apple, so to speak. So at this point, we can start to moderate air coming from the lower respiratory system. So we would say anatomically that this is the lower respiratory airstream coming up to that point from the glottis. We're now in the upper respiratory system. So we control air in a different way when we get past the glottis, starting from those vocal folds closing if we need to affect air that way. It's important to realize that vocal fold closing is like sticking your thumb over a hose. It can make the air come out faster, but you reduce the the volume of air by doing this. So it's not always the ideal solution to, a, to an embouchure problem. What we have here is the facial muscles shown on the left. So we have a round muscle around the mouth that constricts our mouth and so makes our aperture narrow. So this muscle contracts tighter when you go for a narrower embouchure, so higher pitch kind of uh, pieces. All the muscles spreading out from it are dilatory muscles. So they act to widen the aperture or make the, the aperture bigger. If we look on the right hand side again, it's similar to the picture you saw before showing all the many muscles that affect the throat. In this case, it also shows this inner cheek muscle. So it's showing the buccinator at the corner of the mouth there. Very important to control the side dimensions of the oral cavity. If the buccinator is not working, which was uh, the case with Lindsay, the tongue also tries to change the oral cavity by uh, changing its position. So you have this round oral cavity, a bone at the top, muscles on each side, this buccinator, then the tongue muscle at the, at the bottom of the mouth. If the side muscles aren't working, the bottom muscle, the tongue muscle tries to compensate and adapt for it, which of course affects articulation enormously. Um, we do see various problems with um, lips with embouchure or with jaw shakes or with uh, jaw locking. There's all sorts of problems that can happen. These are just a couple of examples of lack of control of the lip. So on the left hand side with the flute player, the lower lip is pulling over to the left as they play causing a lack of control and lack of fluency in flute playing. Uh, and on the right hand side, the brass player, you can see at the right hand side of the mouth, the lips are starting to pull, up, pull apart there and this trumpet player is getting an air leak on that right hand side from this uh, deformity. So what we want to do when we look at retraining, is we want to do a progressive stage series of exercises that work not only on uh, movements, but on the feel of the movement, this proprioceptive ability, sensory motor, so being able to feel what is happening and create an appropriate movement response. Uh, with the neuromuscular, we want to make sure that we train for small amounts of time often to try and make sure that we're staying very focused on the movements we're doing. We don't want to do mindless practice here because it's very important that we're retraining the brain uh, to, to be able to control movements. And we go from this very conscious focused time into gradually taking that focus away from these internal uh, mechanisms and becoming more externally focused on the music and sound and, and other features as the person progresses. Uh, we wanted to do this with a holistic uh, approach, so incorporating elements of somatic learning, complete body, because the effects are so widespread, this body mapping with complete um, focus on all elements of the performer. And in this case, the duration of the uh, intervention lasted two years and it was run by Bridget with input from myself and various other health teams to try and provide input wherever necessary. So the team involved comprised the musician, the professional orchestral horn player, the third horn player in her section, Bronwyn as the specialist musicians, physiotherapist and anatomist, myself a music educator and body mapping practitioner, 
Also a speech and language therapist was involved and a recovered horn player as a mentor. So you can see there are five of us in the core team. I was present at all the musicians sessions with the physiotherapist, the speech therapist and the mentor horn player in order to coordinate liaise and manage the team. The additional music and health professionals that we consulted um, ranged from an occupational therapist, family doctor, psychologist, horn teacher, and three horn playing colleagues. The occupational therapist managed the case for the medical insurance and the occupational insurance matters, the legal matters and work liaison. Family doctor was consulted roughly every six months as needed. Importantly, a psychologist provided psychotherapy and counseling, including a somatic focus and trauma release. We were very fortunate to also have the input of a very knowledgeable horn teacher with experience in embouchure retraining, who gave pedagogical input from time to time. And the fact that there were three horn playing colleagues who assisted and were supportive was very good and that it kept our musician connected to her horn playing colleagues and friends. Perhaps we can just take a look now at the delineation of these collaborative roles and responsibilities. We can see them here in three categories, the health professionals, the somatic educator and the music professionals. So let's begin with the health professionals role. Let's begin with the health professionals role. The health professional carried out the initial evaluation. This included a detailed history of dystonia symptoms and relevant health history, as well as psych physical, mental and social factors and goals for treatment. At the initial physical assessment, the health professional observed instrumental posture, performance and movement dysfunctions and did a full assessment of the orofacial, pharyngeal and respiratory mechanisms. The staged long-term rehabilitation plan was devised, beginning with off-instrument exercises, which are crucial to build strength and coordination. Moving on to the role of the somatic educator now. The initial components here include the evaluation of potential playing stressors, both mental and physical aspects, as well as reviewing daily activities such as computer use, practice habits, attitudes to playing, and also movement and posture. Assisting with goal setting is an important part too. Continuous activities would be movement and posture training with the instrument, general somatic work that may enhance capacity, proprioceptive training, and mindfulness and breath work. Towards the later stages of rehabilitation, building independence was achieved through the learning of self-awareness and self-evaluation strategies, mental skills guidance, and sometimes also referral to psychotherapy, lifestyle and exercise professionals, and graded strategies to enhance physical and mental capacity and overall well-being. Now, the music educator's role. This initially focused on playing evaluation and pedagogical needs, reviewing technical elements and practice methods and checking instrument condition and setup. Ongoing components included monitoring the reduction of muscular tension during playing and guidance with playing repertoire and resources. Later, assisting with the progressive return to play schedule, the gradual integration of new skills in playing to prevent recurrence and also graded performance exposure were important aspects. Okay, so with this video, we're going to show you through the run of the case series now from this particular first video at 2017 in October. At the time she was seen in August, she was unable to play at all, so we couldn't videotape any playing. Uh, what you will see is there were very fundamental issues here. We were just trying to start with very simple things like providing good air support, uh, trying to do this with a stable hyoid, so, so trying to keep the length of her throat or the root of her tongue relatively stable and focus on the, the lower air support, uh, releasing jaw overactivity, getting better muscle control of the facial and buccinator muscles. The somatic educator, Bridget, she worked on integrating this into whole body awareness. She uh, also dealt a lot with the initial stages of trying to help um, the, the psychological and emotional support elements. It was very important that Bridget implement a plan 
um, a plan of returning to the exercises. As I said, I did an extremely comprehensive start. It's very overwhelming to have all the elements of your playing uh, pulled apart, analysed and and an approach made to come together and Bridget was able to divide this into a logical sequential plan. So if we look at the playing now in the earliest video we have, So you can see the jaw tremor is still quite evident. Three months into rehabilitation, we noted the importance of the mental aspects and how they supported the proprioceptive learning. These included her ability to manage stress and muscular tension better, the awareness of habitual preset actions prior to playing, overachieving tendency, self-acceptance was very important here, and the self-identity as a horn player. She was practicing consciously at this stage to integrate the focused and very detailed embouchure retraining within the whole body and mindful holistic approach that Bronwyn described. So after six months, I uh, helped with a video consultation. So with Bridget present with Lindsay, it was possible for me to uh, look at the way Lindsay was playing with Bridget running around trying to uh, take every angle of the video to try and make this facilitate this process and a group discussion, of course, including the patient themselves on uh, issues they were having and where we needed to move. You probably noticed from the earlier videos that the mouthpiece was very asymmetrically placed. Once you'd got to a certain amount of uh, recovery, we started to work on a more uh, centralised and normal mouthpiece placement so that we could bring everything back to neutral. So bring her jaw and orofacial and all her muscles back to neutral. Also her posture needed to kind of uh, do this because she'd got used to taking the horn over to the left hand side to where her embouchure was living or her mouthpiece was living more to the point. Um, we were focusing a lot more on starting to refine things like the role of the jaw and not overusing it, uh, trying to be much more careful with uh, releasing a lot of tension there and just using the very small uh, scaffolding kind of movements of it. Um, again, trying to work us on more advanced focusing of breathing, relating more to how she's applying it in a musical context and, and this preparation of this. So, so trying to make sure everything's ready before you blow into the instrument. Um, and this was done with Bridget working on making sure that she graded the amount of effort or the amount of release, listening to the sound she was making, because that can be used as positive reinforcement to change what you're doing and helping her to keep on track. It can be very difficult to motivate yourself over these long time periods. So if we have a look at her now, trying to get back this recreating of the good feeling and sound, At eight months, integrating the neuromuscular, musical and technical aspects occurs as we begin the return to play. Continuing with the physio and speech exercises, beginner repertoire 
brings in phrasing, dynamics, airflow, tongue shape in different registers, increasing agility whilst retaining stability, and gradually increasing range. Using a mirror and coordinating rhythmic elements and quicker start times using a metronome are important elements here. So by the time we got to a one year mark, I again reviewed with Lindsay. So this steady progression of gradually uh, more demands on her uh, really was accentuated here where we're starting to refine and fine tune things. So some of the early steps are quite rudimentary, regaining muscle balance and control, getting some strength, um, putting sort of simple steps back together. And at 12 months, we were able to start things a little more uh, musically applicable, a little more complicated. So trying to integrate all these factors like her position of her head and jaw and um, breathing control with things like the mouthpiece placement, setting the tongue, making sure it was timed, making sure that the muscles on both sides were operating as they should be being a little more strict on things like not stabilizing the corners of her mouth with muscles that were pulling down the corners, trying to make sure she used her buccinators to stabilize and, and doing uh, a lot more dynamic lower lip activation while keeping her upper lip stable. So this was much more fine tuning and more complex things moving towards much more playing relevant kind of levels of difficulty. I must say this is a hard stage for horn, uh, for any musician because you really she's really having to think a lot about getting all this now uh, setting and timing in place, but by listening to it and, and uh, continuing to practice this in short focus sessions, it gradually becomes uh, automated. At about 21 months, we can see that she has been able to integrate numerous elements. We see greater fluency, agility, ease, and confidence.
At 24 months, she is able to play a section of an advanced standard repertoire piece. Intermittently, she is able to demonstrate playing at a professional level, although consistency, accuracy, and stamina are still lacking. So an overview of the progress in this case study. It's important to understand that with focal dystonia, retraining is the only known curative approach whereby nerve control can be reattained. However, this is usually always a slow process, a minimum of 12 months or so, and external stressors will slow this progress. So after 12 months of rehabilitation, this French horn player returned to work in the orchestra. The preliminary work reintegration comprised observing rehearsals, playing a few sessions each week in low pressure situations, and doubling on selected items in manageable orchestral work. So she played what she could and was permitted to pay for a replacement when necessary. Then after 18 months, she was able to play more of her required duties. However, after 24 months, despite the continued excellent progress, it became evident that her job requirements as third and occasional also first horn were not yet consistently achievable. A formal work appraisal audition was arranged by orchestra management. Her playing was satisfactory during the audition and the excellent improvement and level attained was acknowledged. But a mutually agreed upon resignation was decided. The orchestra could not afford to provide more time of work, which was still needed to consolidate this rehabilitation. So <clears throat> the French horn player is still a professional musician, but instead of full-time orchestral work, is now focusing on an expanding and busy teaching practice. The findings of this case study indicate that the cooperative teamwork resulted in very encouraging progress. The French horn player gradually regained her previous playing skill after 24 months of rehabilitation. The instrument specific motor control exercises were very well supported by the somatic training in the form of body mapping instruction, the French horn teacher's pedagogical input and the psychological and medical support received. This case study suggests that such a multidisciplinary approach can be effective for managing and rehabilitating embouchure dystonia. It's likely that such approaches could also be utilized for other complex musicians playing related disorders as well as for enhancing performer capacity and overall well-being. The collaborative and coordinated approach, integrating the combination of professional expertise from health and music domains, enabled successful rehabilitation of a complex condition. It's clear, however, that rehabilitation from embouchure dystonia is lengthy and time consuming. Employment and labor legislation regulations regarding occupational injuries may not be adequate for performing artists' needs. And this is an issue which deserves further investigation in South Africa and in other countries. The subject of our case study consented to the sharing of her case and fully endorsed the contents of this presentation. Bronwyn and I are most grateful to her for her participation. 
We've included our reference list on the next few slides. Have a quick look through those. 